And when we come tomorrow night, there'll be no candles, there'll be no vestments. We will experience what the world is like without Christ. Just hear the last seven words and learn from those last seven words. I love what the psalm said tonight. Did you hear it? It said, I will fulfill my vows in the presence of the whole congregation. When you hear the scriptures tonight, you hear some things that that we, I will fulfill my baptism vow in the presence of the whole congregation. I'm not going to go get baptized and then walk off and say, well, me and Jesus have our own thing. I will fulfill my chrismation vows in the presence of the whole congregation. I will fulfill my Eucharistic meal vow, the Lamb's Supper Feast, in the presence of the whole congregation. The vows that we make to the church, we fulfill them in the presence of the whole congregation. We are people of theosis. I'm going to talk about theosis on Sunday morning before we baptize our catechumens because theosis is the becoming. It is the becoming. In the West, we say, if you make a decision and pray a prayer, you have become. But the early fathers would never believe you could have salvation because you made a decision and prayed a prayer. You must continue becoming. Otherwise, you go instantly from infant to adult. There is a process of growth. And that's what the Orthodox faith is about. It's becoming like him. We already have his image, but we must become in his likeness through the growth process. So we hear that our vows, our ordination vows are fulfilled in the presence of the whole congregation. Can't get ordained here and go to another church and say, I'm a deacon here. You were ordained here. This is where you fulfill your vows. You fulfill your marital vows in the congregation that witnessed your marriage. Your marriage does not suddenly become separate from the church. Well, we, I have a marriage and family and issues and things I want to do. You fulfill your marital vows in the presence of the whole congregation. We fulfill our death vows all the way from baptism to anointing the, the sick and the death. It's all fulfilled in the presence. The last thing that happens when you're buried is your casket is incensed as a reminder that your vows were made in the congregation to the people. And so when we get to tonight's message, we come understanding the vows we make, our chrismation vows. Even when we bring a baby, we make a vow for them. We promise we will raise you in the house when it's inconvenient, when there's other things you'd want to do. We'll teach you reverence in the house of God. We'll teach you. I had to help my great grandson the other day. He called, he called Deacon Todd Todd. I said, That's not Todd, that's Deacon Todd. Amen. We're not that casual with the vows that we made in the house of God. Some people say, Well, that's legalism. No, it's a rec- it's a humility. It's humility to say, I have deacons and I have people that God has assigned to my life. We treat each other so secularly and casually. Hey girl. Hey dude. Because we come in the house of God and we don't recognize the gift God has given us. I was once with Alex and we were with some business associates and he said the hardest thing in the world was for him to introduce me as Paul to these people. Because it's so against his grain to even utter the words, that's Paul Shell." Are you following me? But again, that's all about humility, fulfilling my vows in the house of God. So we get to the Eucharist. We understand that Jesus is the lamb that the high priest of God offers for our salvation. Notice in the Old Testament, they were told how to eat the lamb. Standing with a staff, it couldn't be boiled, it had to be roasted. It wasn't about how it tasted. It was about what it represented. It wasn't whether I like lamb it was that this is consumed by the whole congregation. Amen. Yes. <laughs> For those of you who don't, li- who don't like lamb Saturday night, just at least taste, touch it to your tongue and put it out and say, at least I tasted with the congregation. <laughs> I know some of you feel targeted by that, but we are a community, aren't we? So we get down to this mystery. The most awkward moment in the church every year was... The foot washing service. (laughs) 
Let's make sure we get our pedicures and get our lotion and sand our heels down so they're nice and smooth. Let's make sure we change our socks before we come because we don't want anyone to get that close and intimate to that dirty part of us. And it wasn't intended to be a ritual anyway. It was intended to be a part of a meal. But the, the mystery and the washing was not the actual foot washing itself, although it represented something. The actual mystery was, he said, you need to do this. What he was saying is you need to love one another to the end. Even if you're going to be betrayed by someone. I know as a bishop, when I ordain someone, I can never write them off. No matter how much they hurt me. I don't have the option to say, I'll go find another community to be a bishop at. Because once I've broken the bread with them, once I've shared the flesh and blood with them, once I've shared the Passover meal with them, I don't have the option to get offended enough to find somewhere else. Because I would have to break my, only my vow. I'd have to break our vow for me to do that. You want to know what washing feet is? Washing feet is getting down to touching the parts of each other we don't want touched. And knowing I'm not going to betray you when I have to deal with that dirty part of you. And he said, this is what I'm trying to teach you here. I'm trying to teach you that it's easy for us to break a meal. You know, a meal is a powerful thing. If you want to cut a good business deal, you go out to dinner, don't you? Don't you have lunch? Now they have just lunch for people who want to hook up. That's how, power, <laughs> that's how powerful a meal is. God knew that the breaking of bread and the eating of a meal is the way we consummate our relationships. And he said, here is the ultimate covenant meal. We eat from one loaf, we drink from one cup, we share with one another. Tonight, we realize that Jesus instituted this meal because he knew by us partaking of the common meal of bread and wine, the co not the unique special, but the common meal keeps us in the right perception of our communal unity as a community. Are you following me? So then it beckons the question again. When will the sacred override the secular? Do we really wait, go to bed Saturday night saying, I made a vow to be there tomorrow? Do we really go to bed with that thought? Do we really walk through these doors and say, when we all are praying, it's a time we all pray. It's not break time. The most sacred moment is when the priest or the bishop is praying with the congregation and we think that's our time to go do our thing. Lent is unusual because it brings to the surface the things we don't want to deal with. If you've done the 40-day of decrease, you know, what is it I withhold from God? What is it I withhold from Him? What is it I escape? What is it I deny? Where is it I have to be heard and I'm not willing to be silent? So tonight is sacred and holy. We begin a new year. We prepare for a new year. It's called the Lenten Spring. We come and we deal with these issues. A year from now, will you be more devoted than you are today? To the vows. It's a mystery, as Deacon has said. It's a mystery. I want to tell you something about loyalty. Loyalty is only loyalty when you don't feel like doing it. Loyalty is not loyalty when you feel like doing it. You're not loyal when you feel like being loyal. You're loyal when everything in you doesn't want to do it, but you stay loyal. Devotion is not when I feel like being devoted, when it's all about me and I want God to bless my new endeavor, so I come to church and say, bless my new endeavor, God. 
It's when everything's falling apart and I'm not even sure whether God exists. I'm not even sure if there is a God. But I go and honor him by faith even if I don't even reconcile his existence totally. Mother Teresa spent over 10 years of her life questioning whether God even existed. But she stayed devoted to her vows. What controls your life? Your feelings, your fears, your insecurities, your expectations, or your vows. When you come through the doors of the church, you have to deal with your very first vow. I was baptized into this community. This is where I'm saved. I'm not saved by a decision and a prayer. I'm saved by the life of this community. This is where my salvation is. Because it is the collective prayers and life of this church that intercedes for my needs according to his riches and glory. When I come up to receive the Holy Eucharist, it is my vows that bring me here. The Bible says it's better not to make a vow than to make a vow and break it. Now we've all messed up. There's a difference between breaking a vow and burying it and breaking a vow and repenting from it. Because God's power for repentance is awesome. In fact, in God's eyes, if you mess up but you repent, you never broke the vow. But how long do we kick against the goads? This is so difficult because we try to modernize Christianity to make it Christianity to make it palatable, com- comfortable and convenient for our expectations of a lifestyle. The dreams and it was in today's deal. The dreams you have for a house, a car and a life, you need to bury them. Bury those dreams. Let them die. Because until we bury those dreams, we will resist Christ. And we will compromise our vows. And we'll wonder, where is God when we need healing? Where is God when we need deliverance? Where is God when I need a breakthrough financially? Where is God when I need help? Now you know why only a few people were at the cross when Jesus died. Why he said it's better to bless your enemy than to curse them. Do good to those who despitefully use you. That is the call of the kingdom. Thank God we're in theosis. Thank God the day we made the decision and confessed Christ, we don't have to be perfect that day. (laughs) Thank God that we said this is the beginning of our journey, this is not the end. Because you've heard people say, well, I can't believe a Christian could do that. The only people that say that are people who believe you get it all when you confess it. (laughs) The bottom line is we're all growing in baby steps. So this week is so important because it challenges our vows. It challenges our decision. It challenges our appetites. It challenges everything in us. And as I said in the beginning, there's always some voice somewhere telling you, you're not thinking straight. This is irrational. This is illogical. This doesn't make sense, as Deacon has said. But I want to tell you something. When I hold the flesh and blood up and Father and Father do, I'm not lying to you. I'm not going to lie to you about this. Your greatest moment of joy is when you forsake what you think you need to embrace the sacred. Then you'll find out what your joy is. Tomorrow night we'll come and hear the last seven words our Lord spoke. Do we know what they mean to us? We have seven men we chose that are not deacons, that are going to come up and share from the community so we can meditate. What did he mean? Those last seven perfect words he spoke on that cross. Then we will come and kiss the cross. There'll be the procession of the cross, and we'll kneel down, we'll kiss that cross, and we'll say, I identify with it. I'm not afraid of the cross. I'm not afraid to take up my cross. I'm identifying with that cross, which is a part of the Paschal journey. And then we'll come Saturday morning. And here's always the challenge. How many of us will get up out of our beds on Saturday morning and come and visit the cross with our family and kneel back in the room there quietly for a few minutes and say, Lord, what have I withheld from you? Lord, what have I denied you? 
Lord, where do I not trust you? And then Saturday night we'll come with the bonfire and this room will be dark and we'll all come in with these little lights and we'll start to see the illumination of a risen Christ. And then we will take the Eucharist and we will have a meal together. We'll all eat the lamb together. As a reminder that our fast was communal, our faith is communal, and our vows are communal. The most frustrating thing in the world is to trust and believe in God, but not walk the path that allows him to let, for us to enjoy that path. Amen. Sunday morning, the pinnacle of pinnacles. New believers. Lent was instituted for new believers. It was instituted for catechumens. In fact, they had to be vetted so hard, they all had to be able to recite. In, for, in front of the community, they had to get up individually and recite the Nicene Creed, the Creed. They had to be questioned. Are you sincere about your faith, or are you just someone else making you do this? Thank God we don't vet that way that now, I guess we trust our relationships, our communal relationships with each other. So, with that said, I've laid out the groundwork for this most holy week, this most sacred time. We need to show our children, Saturday morning is not always about cartoons. Sometimes it's about kneeling in front of the cross. Sometimes it's about going and getting some flowers, and going out of our way, and having our little world interrupted that we like so much, and saying, Lord, see me here. I'm examining myself. I will fulfill my vows in the presence of the congregation. Those vows include forgiving those who have betrayed us and reconciling lives that are willing to be reconciled. Not everybody we, 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 we extend a hand to will receive it, but we don't pick and choose who will and won't. Amen? Stand to your feet, beloved. Father, show us what it means to truly wash one another's feet. That it's we never turn away someone that we broke bread with at the table of the Lord. Oh, that the sacred would trump the secular. Oh, that the sovereign would trump the slacker. That the righteous Righteousness of God would override the ability of humans so that our children and their children would recognize our faith was not fake, but real. I lift my hands and bless you all now with all that is good and pure. Continue your journey if you stumble, the Lord will lift you up. Continue your journey. Rejoice in the baptism of new believers. Wash their feet and teach them to wash the feet of others. Keep your vows. Quit looking for an out, an escape, a justifiable reason to renounce the sacred. And I pray this, that we as a community would be enlarged with obedience and love, mercy and compassion, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us profess our faith in Almighty God.